All right, guys, y'all ready? Y'all know me. It's I'm a little different, a little crazy, a little out the box. But, uh, you know, you know, I want to give you a message today that I talked about last week. And, um, you know, it's actually about the coming of the Lord and how important it is for us to be ready and have our eyes open. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to kind of take it from a different perspective probably than hitting the regular scriptures that everybody goes to but hidden in the word God lets us know what's going to happen in the end you know by going back to the beginning and um, so this really caught me last week um, I really need to say this before I get started um, and I feel like I need to share this with you guys um, my sister came over this morning and we wound up having a really good talk and stuff like that. But something was brought up and it was kind of amazing how last week I gave you guys Luke chapter 19. And by the time our conversation was over with my sister, we wound up being brought to Luke chapter 19. Um, and our, uh, But in our conversation, um, there's a lot of things that are happening right now. There's people, I mean, I can't even tell you, well, I probably could. But just this past week, you know, or two weeks or so, how many phone calls I've gotten over people dying, you know, uh, just out of all of a sudden, um, all the way down to suicides with very close friends of mine, um, which is like, Lord, you know, and we tend to, or people will tend to blame God for things, and, uh, but you got to realize the world that we live in, in. it's a mess. And it's not going to get better. It's only going to get worse. Um, so it's important for us to really stay focused on Jesus Christ. To, to, to stay focused on the signs and what he's trying to set, you know, say to us. And not blame him for anything. A lot of people want to blame the Lord for things that happen. You know, I prayed and my wife died. I prayed and my husband died. And, and we'll get bitter. I want to tell you an incident that happened with me when I was working at the Pontchartrain Hotel really quick. Um, and this is, I mean, this was just a direct word from the Lord because man in his own thinking could never just come up with something like this. Um, when I was a superintendent for Citadel Builders, I was remodeling the Pontchartrain Hotel. I was there for a while and, um, you know, they used to call me preach over there. You know, I didn't tell them I was a preacher or a minister, but over time... You know, uh, just letting your light shine. You know, people tend to realize that you're different. You're not, you know, joining in all the, all the reindeer games, right? If I could say it like that. But anyway, um, so this guy walks in, and it was at this time, which is pretty crazy amazing. It was right around Christmas time. And, um, you know, I'd already had baptized like five people in a cattle trough at the Pontchartrain Hotel, you know, and that had led to the Lord and stuff. And this guy walks in and he says, hey, preach. You know, he said, uh, I got something for you. And me, I like a good, you know, I like a man question me on the word, you know. So I'm thinking this guy is going to fire a question at me about the Bible. And he said, you know, he said, hey, preach, I used to be just like you. And I'm sitting at my desk, and this guy is the data guy. He's running all the data communication cables in the building and stuff like that. And he said, I used to be just like you. He said, you know, until, you know, uh, and he said, in fact, I was a youth pastor. He said, I'll never step foot in church again. I'll never pray again. I'll never talk to God and all of these things. He just went on. And I'm just waiting, you know, for why. And he said, uh, he said, try this one on. You got, an you got uh, answers for all the guys that come in here that question you and all that stuff. He says, try this one. And it really put me in my seat when he had said this. He said, yeah, I used to be uh, a youth pastor. And one day I got home from work. And when I walked in my door, I caught my pastor in bed with my wife. And he said, what do you have to say about that? And he was really, really cocky. And let me tell you something, when I tell you it took the wind out of my sails, I've never been hit like that before with a question like that, you know. And I kind of just sat back and I'm like, Lord, you know, what do I even begin to say to someone that's been hurt like this, you know. 
and all of a sudden the spirit hit me he said I want you to ask him a question for me and I'm sitting at my desk and I'm like ah hey Lord what's the question he said you ask him when he got home from work did he catch me in bed with his wife or a man Wow. and let me tell you something when I asked him that question he did all but collapse I mean just the power of God hit him so hard and he began to weep and cry and right there you know God broke him down and that Sunday which would have been around Christmas time he was in church with me and rededicated his life to the Lord his brother is a pastor his brother was a pastor in Kentucky I think it was or Illinois and he called his brother up while I was standing right there and telling his brother what the Lord had spoke to him and, and how he gave his life back to Jesus Christ so I want to tell you something if you find yourself going through a hard time right now in any kind of way shape or form don't blame it on Jesus Christ because it is what well, people die of cancer it's not God's fault it's because of the sin that's entered into the world Amen. You know, once sin entered, look, we die of all kind of things. Old age, yeah. cancer, you know, uh, car accidents. That's not God's fault. Right. Yeah, but God could do something, you, you, you might say. Well, little do we know how much God's hand of protection is on us each and every day. Right. We could have probably died in our lifetime a thousand times if it wouldn't have been for God. Right. But when man is left to his own ways... And he doesn't, God's continually pouring out his love and his grace and his mercy and wooing him and drawing him. You know what? Sometimes God just says, hey, he'll continue to draw us. But sometimes he says, you know what? I'm just stepping back and I'm going to let him have his way. And that message, we're going to walk that message into what Jesus said as he was coming into Jerusalem. You're going to see that, man, there comes a time in our life and there's going to come a time in the end when the restraining order of the Holy Spirit is going to be lifted and pulled away and man's going to be turned over to Satan and all you know his uh, his the worldly pleasures and and we're going to see things that are going to be manifested in, our, in this earth like we've never seen before and we got glimpses of that in the past and today's message has nothing to do with um, you know, I know it's Christmas time, you know, and everybody is celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ and all of that stuff. This has nothing to do with take to take away with, you know, with any of that, because I'll tell you what actually it's not about the birth right now, although Christmas is about they say is about the birth of Jesus Christ. But, you know, I'm going to tell you this. The Bible says to be ready in season and out of season. That's right. You know, when I was talking to the Lord about being ready in season and out of season, do you realize at this time, December 25th is 24th, 25th, is when God the Father, an out of season time, what do I mean by that? There ain't no farmers out there sowing right now. No. Right? They ain't planting. Why? All the sap is going down. It's the winter time. Everything dies. We know when to plant, right? There's a time to plant. You know, but God, at this time, took a seed on December 25th and sowed it into a woman. Out of season. Out of natural season, during the winter solstice, in the darkest part of, you know, if you want to call it in, in, in the history of man, or at the darkest time in the year, at the winter solstice, God took his seed himself and sown it, sowed it into a woman. And nine months later, he was born in the Feast of Tabernacles. Wow. You know what that means? That a seed could be sown right now into you and me. If your ground is fertile and ready to receive, and let me tell you something. Every time someone receives Jesus Christ, you're just like a woman. The Bible says that we're all the bride of Christ. And that seed is being sown in us. And over time, as it begins to grow in us, eventually it's going to come forth and be birthed out of us. Right? So it is a time of sowing. And it is a time that God sowed. This is a time that Gabriel overshadowed Mary and said that you know, you're going to receive seed. Can you imagine what Joseph was going through? You know, this is the time when more people commit suicide and die. And, you know, it's, it's the, the time of the year that we're in. Can you imagine coming home to your, 
you know, to your, your uh, fiance and she's saying, I'm pregnant with child of the Holy Spirit. You don't think he was going through some dark times? <laughs> Joseph, he's like, what? Are you crazy? Right? It's a serious thing. So, I want to uh, bring you from that. Not to take anything away from it, but to really show you what was happening and what was going on. That in the darkest time, here it is, God sows a seed, which is the light of the world. Right? So, you know, in the midst of everything that's happening right now, in the midst of the calamity and things that we're going through, man, we have hope. Right? And if you can receive it, God wants to sow a word into you today. Amen. So I want to read something to you. And uh, it's out of, uh, I'm taking this from, it's all about the coming of the Lord in Luke chapter 19. But you know me. i got to lay some groundwork first. So in Luke chapter 19, in, uh, I'm going to read verse 41. And then I'm going to go into what I, I want to share with you guys. But this is going to be the key scripture to what it is the Lord had spoke to me. Because you don't want to miss the time of His coming. You don't want to miss what it is that God's doing because a lot depends on it. So check this out. In Luke chapter 19, verse 28, you know, it, Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem. And looking at Jerusalem, He begins to weep over it. Why does He weep over it? Because He knows what's coming. Right? And this is what He says. In verse 41, And when he had come near, he beheld the city, and he wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes, for the days shall come upon thee, that thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round about, encircle thee and keep thee in on every side. Now Christ is projecting a prophecy that's going to be fulfilled in 70 AD. He's seeing something so horrific. That's why he's weeping. He's not weeping over you know the Gethsemane and the cross but what he's talking about is the destruction of Jerusalem that's coming. But if they would have known the time and they would have heeded his word, they could have been saved from it. If they would have only listened and paid attention to what it was he was saying. And he said, and they shall lay, and they shall lay you, meaning they shall demolish thee even unto the ground, and thy children within thee. Wow. Can you imagine? They'll be crying out. Now, first thing I want to tell you, this is the temple of God, the house of God. Pharisees, Sadducees, these are the, you know, the leading religious who sit up there, think they're all holy. He's projecting this to them and telling them, and they're like, no way, no way, right? And they shall not leave within thee one stone upon another. Why? Here's the key verse. Because thou knewest not the time of thine visitation. Man, we have to be ready. And with that scripture, I want to bring you back to Luke chapter 19 and verse 1. And I want to start reading from there so I can tie this stuff into you. You ready? And this was with Zacchaeus. This is pretty amazing. Um, and Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. Now Zacchaeus, named me, his name means pure, which was chief among the publicans. And he was rich, and he sought to see Jesus who he was. How many of you guys are really seeking to see Jesus for who he is? Right? That's a key right there. How many people truly say they're seeking Jesus, or they just, you know, they just come? Right? And, uh, and he could not for the press because he was of little stature. And he ran before and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him. Now remember, the sycamore tree is a fig tree. That's what it would, you know. So in order to see Jesus, you've got to climb up the fig tree. And we know that is a reference to the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant will show you who Jesus is, right? 
to see him, for he was passing that way. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and he saw him and he said to Zacchaeus, Make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Now if you want to see Christ, go into the Old Covenant. Climb up the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the Old Covenant. But as soon as you see Christ, you're going to find out when he saw him, what did Jesus do? He said, come out of that tree and climb up in his tree, the tree of life. Right? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying uh, that he was gone to be the guest with a man that was a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood unto the Lord. Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I've given to the poor. And I have taken anything that I have taken from any man by false accusation, I've restored it unto him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to thine house. For so much as he he also is the son of Abraham. Wow, pretty amazing, right? For the son of man was come to seek and to save that which is lost. The context is, you got to remember, this is Jesus at the end. He's about to die. He's riding into Jerusalem. He passed through Jericho. He's riding into Jerusalem. It's all about salvation, being saved, right? He's given this scenario as to what happened. So watch what he does. The very next thing he does, he goes into a parable. Because we're going to draw a parable is uh, an earthly uh, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. You understand? So now, with salvation coming to Zacchaeus, it's to show us how we must be saved, right? Zacchaeus, his name means pure. You have to have a pure heart looking for Jesus. When you see him, he takes notice of you. He calls you out of that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which produces death and now brings you into life, right? right? And a manifestation that salvation had come to Zacchaeus has nothing to do with money. His heart was changed. He went from, from stealing and taking to giving, yeah. right? There's the message that's wrapped up. But watch the parable he gives. The next, verse 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. This is about his coming. So this is all about what's going down. We could take notice to what's going to happen in the end. So he says this. And he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. This nobleman is Jesus Christ, right? And he says, and he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, occupy till I come. That's what the Lord told us. These are servants, not sinners. You understand? Yeah. Right? But his citizens, but his citizens hated him and sent messengers after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. These are the Pharisees and Sadducees and because he's coming to, you know, to the kingdom to receive what is his. But the Pharisees and Sadducees and the religious doesn't want to want to deliver what's rightfully his. Right. Because they want to kill him. Right. We know the parable. And he says, and it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, Kingdom. This is when he comes back. Then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. So he used money to show forth 10 pounds, right? Five pounds and one pound. It represents the gifts that God has given you to produce, to bring forth more. So God, as a bride of Christ, has commanded us to be fruitful and multiply. Well, I received the Lord and, and you just go off and stay by yourself and you don't share anything. Well, when the master returns, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. And watch what this is. This is what this is all about. About his coming and what's going to happen. And he says, But the citizens hate him and sent a message after him saying, We will not uh, leave this man to reign over us. And it came to pass when he was returned, having received the kingdom. Then he commanded the servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given this money. 
that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. And that's pretty amazing. Zacchaeus was a publican having to do with money, so he's just keeping everything in order. Then came the first saying, Lord, he said, thy pound hath uh, uh, had gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, uh, Well, thy good and faithful servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, uh, thou will have authority over ten cities. Now cities are a representation of peoples. So the money now has been translated from money to people. Got it? Pretty amazing, huh? And the second came and said, Lord, um, thy pound that thy uh, hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. And another came saying, Lord, behold, here is a pound which thy have kept and laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an asture man. Uh, thou takest up that which thou not hast laidest down, and reapest that that thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. This ain't talking about sinners. You understand? Yeah. It's talking about you and me. Right? Thou knewest that I was an asture man, taking up that that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then thou gavest not my money unto the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with a surety. But he said unto them, that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given. And from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. Man, we have been called to be fruitful and multiply. To let our light shine. And look, if, if you think that you don't have a talent, you do. Well, then you join up with someone, right? And, and work, whether it's working in the children's ministry or giving something to your neighbor, just letting your light shine, right? But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring them hither and slay them before me. Oh, what? Can I, that's written in red. That's what Jesus said. Right. You heard what I said? This is all about His coming. Yeah. The grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ is upon us right now. But when He comes back if, as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, it's Judgment Day. Yeah. And they're going to appear before Him. And, you know, you don't want to be the one that says, you know, uh, like my mom had a dream one time and she said, you know, you hear many people, look, man, I just want to make it. I just want to make it. That's fine if you just want to make it. But how are you going to feel when you get on the other side? Like my mom had a dream. She made it to heaven. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I made it. But she didn't do anything for the kingdom. And she was like, why didn't I listen? Well, I could have done more. Well, now, we always feel like we can do more. But look, we can, you know, we can be a good bride. And that seed that was sown into us, man, the Word of God waters it and it begins to grow. And we put ourselves in places where we can help others and do things that God... Because remember, it's all about the gift. It's all about giving. That's why salvation came to the house of Zacchaeus. His whole life was changed. It goes from, you know, give me, give me, give me and what I can get to, you know what, Lord, psh, just give it to him. Because, you know, you're laying up in store something that, you know, somebody can't take from you. Now watch this. So remember, this whole message is about Jesus Christ coming in. Now right after this, watch what he says he gets into. Um... If we're going to see where I remember where I was at, 19. Okay, here it is, the triumphal entry, right? The triumphal entry is about Christ coming in through the gate, riding upon the colt, the donkey, remember? Which is pretty amazing. I'm going to show you some insights with this. I hope I get to the other thing. But anyway, so this is all about Christ's coming. That's why this last verse that goes out that I told you about, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. This is a foreshadow of when Christ returns in the end. His first coming through those gates. It's Passover time. Wow. 
Does that give us an inclination as to when Christ is going to come? Watch this. Pretty amazing stuff. So it says, um, And when he had spoken, he went before, ascending up into Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he was come nigh to uh, Beth Bethphage, which means uh, the house of unripe figs. Wow. He's coming to a place where the figs are unripe. It's Passover time. Right? And he says, and, uh, and Bethany, which means house of sorrow, a house of poverty, at uh, a mount called Olives. And he sent to his disciples. Now watch this. So at his coming, he's now sending two disciples to go do something, right? Go to the city gate. Untie the colt that's there. And if anyone asks you why you're untying him, why you're loosing him, Tell him because the master has need of him. Well, you know that colt, that jackass, right, is the same is the same as the jackass that Balaam rode upon, and that jackass spoke as a man. Yeah. It's a servant. Loose that servant who's bound at the door. That's you and me when we, receive, when we receive Jesus Christ. The two disciples, the two witnesses, he sent them out by twos. Go untie them, loose them. And Aunt Goldie, Jesus has need of you. He wants to set you free. Hallelujah. Ah! Yes. Why? Because he wants to sit on you, rest upon you, so that you can do what the Master wants. Amen. Man. Amazing. That donkey is symbolic to a man. How do I know that? One in the old covenant spoke as a man. What did that donkey say to Balaam? Haven't I been a good servant to you all my days? And you're going to keep beating me? Well, guess what? Satan, that who's riding upon you, who hasn't received Jesus, has been beating you all the time. Yes. Right? right? Yes. Hallelujah. And that good old donkey, he's just law. He sees, here it is, he sees, you know, the angels about to kill Balaam, right? And just like you and me, we're just trying to help people, but they want to kill us. Yeah. Right. Hey, I see the death angel with a sword. He's, you know, there's, there's some things that's fixing to go down. Just listen to me. I ain't listening to you. You're a jackass. You're just a donkey. <laughs> No, I'm speaking as a man. I see something that you don't. And that's what it's about. If they would have known the hour of their visitation, if they would have known the peace that was upon them, Jesus Christ riding in, they could have been saved from what was about to happen to Jerusalem. That is a picture of what's going to come in the end. Man. So he says... He said, go ye unto the village over against you. So they are on the Mount of Olives, right? They got to go through the Valley of Jehoshaphat, which means judgment. They enter in at the gate, right at the gate of the city of Jerusalem is tied a donkey, a colt. Go ye into the village over against you, in which uh, at your entering you shall find a colt tied, wherein yet never a man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do you lose him? Thus you shall say unto him, because the Lord, the Lord has need of him. Man, there's people that, they don't want you to get your, your loved one saved. You know, they fight, they war against you, fight against you. They would, because they don't see, they would rather your loved ones, oh, you know, you're going to go try to uh, bring, what's his name, to Jesus too? I mean, look, that's what it's about manifesting the light and once you've received the light man you get the insight of the Holy Spirit as to things that are coming I mean that's what it says that in John it says that he will make known unto you things to come so this hour that Jesus is riding in that they're expecting the kingdom to manifest that's why they put king of kings over the cross they was looking for a king. He came in as the lamb to set us free spiritually before physically. They're looking for the king. 
And they're proclaiming it. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of, now we, King James says, Lord. But Yahweh is what it, you know, been translated. And here it is, you know, four days later, kill him. Kill him, crucify him. Right? So watch. So he says, uh, and, if, and he says, and they that were sent uh, in the way, and they found even as he said unto them. What is that? How did he know that a colt was tied? This is the leading of the Holy Spirit. The only way someone could come unto the Lord is if the Spirit draws him. God will send you places that, you know, hey, I know there's many people in here that's had encounters. Man, I just felt like I needed to do this. And when you get there, you know, bam, there's somebody. Okay, Lord, here it goes. Right? Man, and that could be the hour of awakening. Right? It says, and they... Um, and as they were loosing the coat, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the coat? And they said, Because the Lord has need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the coat. And they sat uh, Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. Right? Man, we can go off there. And when he was come nigh, even uh, uh, the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice and all the mighty works that they had seen in him, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of Yahweh. Peace on heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among them, the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. Now, I'm going to show you something that's pretty amazing. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, these stones would immediately cry out. What stones? You think it's just little bitty stones that are spread out? No. It's the 12 foundation stones. The 12 stones. Who are the 12 stones? The 12 tribes of Israel. They would testify as to who Jesus Christ is. Remember Jesus was baptized standing on 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan. Remember John the Baptist said, you know, even these stones, uh, uh, John the Baptist said, and don't say unto you that your father is Abraham. And he says, for these, God is able out of these 12 stones. He said stones, but there were 12 that was put in the Jordan by Joshua. That God is able to raise up children unto him, unto Abraham. And I don't want to get off, but anyway. This will go crazy. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And as he answered, and, uh, and he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Here, check this out. Next verse he says, And he would, when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Why did he weep over the city? He, he wept over the city. He wept over the city because of what he saw that was going to come in about 40 years from now, from his time in 70 A.D. So here it is, Jesus, right before he's going to die. It's all a picture of his coming and how it's going to be. That, Like right now, you could say this is, it's not about the birth of Jesus Christ right now. It's actually right now at, at the darkest hour, the winter solstice, man, God has come and was planted inside of a person. And the only one that knew was Mary and then Joseph. And he's like, and it took Gabriel, the angel, telling Joseph, hey, the one that's inside of her is conceived of the Holy Spirit. It's an hour of coming. Wow. Right? He says, so here it is. Jesus is professing and seeing what's in the future. I want to read just a little bit to you. Oh, I got time, guys. Yes, indeed. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and he wept over it, saying, If thou hast known even thou, this is you and me. It's important for you and me to know when Christ in his second visitation is coming. Just like it was important for them to know. 
It's important for you and I to know. Because in the end, they're going to be saying, oh yeah, they've been saying it. Just like it says in Timothy. Where is the coming of the Lord that they've been professing for, you know, thousands of years. They've been saying he's coming. And then when they think not, bam, here it is. But you and I are going to know. And I'm going to show you how important it is, uh, it's going to be to know. He says, saying, if thou would have known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from uh, thine eyes. They was o it was only hid from the eyes of those that did not recognize that Jesus was the Messiah right there. All of those who recognized that Jesus was the Messiah, because now he begins to speak forth a prophecy, and those that recognized Jesus as the Messiah, they knew what was foretold in the future that was going to come, that after he died and rose again, that word went out, hey, when you see Rome gathering up around Jerusalem, run! And all those that believed were saved. And all those that didn't found themselves inside of Jerusalem encircled. No food, no water for a year. Do you know when that happened? They saw it manifest during the Feast of Tabernacles. Isn't that crazy? Titus comes in in the Fall Feast. I mean, I'm sorry, Cyphus comes in in the Fall Feast. Cypheus, Cypheus. Why is that? It's the Feast of Tabernacles. There's over a million Jews there in the city. And here it is, the Roman Legion comes and encircles the city. And as they come in, some of them, some of the, 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 the prophecy that has been spoken, you know, and going out through the disciples, through the people, because remember, it was 40 years later, 70 A.D. They see the Roman legion coming because there's all kind of craziness going on. I mean, craziness in the temple. They see the Roman, they, be, they leave. Well, when they get there, Cepheus, Cepheus, surrounds the city. And just when the city's about to fall, he picks up the army and leaves. Right? And what does the, what does the Jews do and, and all those that's there? Remember, they was encircled over a million people there. All the men gather up, they pursue the Roman army. And they fall on that backside, the back of them. They almost wipe them out. Nobody knows why Cepheus or Cepheus began to leave. They don't know. I know why. Because you see, the Christians, all the Christians didn't get to get out. They didn't get to get out. So all of a sudden, God has them pick up. But, and then here it is, they go after them. They just about destroy the army. They come back with all these goods. And here it is, the Christians that was back there saying, hey, we got to get out of here because Rome's going to destroy the city. They saying, you know, oh yeah, okay, we just destroyed almost all of them over there. Look, we got all the spoils. Yeah, y'all been saying it, it ain't nothing going to go home. But little did they know, Titus was bringing a legion. Millions died. That's what Jesus saw. He saw mothers take food from the husbands and from the daughters. He saw mothers boiling their kids and eating them. Because the famine was so sore. And if they would have listened to Jesus, do you know not one Christian died in Jerusalem? That fall away that happened, Titus came back at Passover and surrounded the city. It started in the feast of, in the fall feast, in the feast of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, in the Feast of Tabernacles, in the fall feast. 
They flee after being there for a little while, six months later in the spring feast, when they're all gathered up again for pilgrimage, during Passover, millions. The food supplies that people had been storing up, they knew would last, you know, if we got to go through something, if Rome ever attacks us, you know, we got food to, to last us forever. We could stay here for years, right? And not with millions of people in Jerusalem. And they come in and surround them. And this is what he says. This is what I'm trying to instill in you that Jesus, when he comes in, he begins to weep. This is what he sees. He sees the armies entrenched around them. And he's begging, if you only knew, I'm giving you the key to salvation. When you see these things, flee to the mountains. Don't, when you see a legion coming, hey, they already know they're going to come and surround Jerusalem. That's why he said, look, if you're in the field, don't go back for your coat. Run. If you're on a rooftop, don't go down and try to get some clothes. Man, when you see it, run out your house and get out of there. When you see these things begin to happen, what is that telling you and me? Yeah, we're going to be proclaiming, hey, the signs are here. The Lord's about to come. He is coming. Oh, yeah, it's going to look, you know, it's going to look devastating and look bad. And all of a sudden, things are going to kind of get good. What are you talking about? Look, it's, everything's going to keep going on like it was. Everything's getting better. No! He's coming. You better be ready. When is he coming? Springtime. He even lets us know. He says... For the day shall come about thee, when thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round about, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even to the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not even leave one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Next thing we see Jesus, he comes in. He gives this prophecy of what's going to happen and he cleansed the temple. Because that temple was a temple of robbers and thieves. That temple is a temple of you and me. That's why, remember, salvation come to the house of Zacchaeus. He was a temple that God came to live in like you and me. Can't be about you and I. It's about giving. Giving to others. Right? It's about being fruitful and multiply. And he says, And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought. Why? Because when the Lord comes back, right? Remember there's a third temple? He's going to cleanse it. We his temple. We his temple. The temple they build right now, he don't live in. This is the, he lives in a house made without hands. Right? Remember how long it took the t how long did it take them to build the temple, Herod's temple? Remember? How many? Forty six years this temple's been in the making, and you're gonna raise it up in, in, in three days. What did Jesus say? That's what he said. He says, Destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. He said, Look, it took forty six years to build this temple. Don't you know your temple is made up of twenty three Y and twenty three X chromosomes, forty six chromosomes that makes your temple. Woo Wow, this is where he lives now. I want to read something a little bit to you really quick. He says, and I won't get to it all. If thou hadst known, even thou at least in thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace. Hey, it's peaceful for me to know that when I see all of this stuff going down, Man, the world is not only it's getting bad, son. It is bad, and it's going to get worse. But we have peace. If you'd have known, right? Let me read it again. If thou hadst known even, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto your peace. I have a peace. I have peace in knowing. I don't care what happens to this world. I don't care if... North Korea or Russia sent a nuke over right now. Nuke it, baby. Blow it up. Because the only thing you need to do is set me free from this wretched temple that I'm living in. Right? This, this flesh. That how I'm only going to be set free. I was just working. You know, I was working and, you know, uh, you know uh, somebody had told me, man, I got a lump in my back. Man, I'm not, 
and I'm just worried about if it's cancer or whatever it is. I'm like, what do you worry about? If you die, you're going to be with Jesus. What? I'm up, man. I got a family. I got this. I got that. I'm be Look, man, you're going to be set free. I, got, I can't even tell you how many lumps I have in my body. Yeah. Hundreds, I got them all over me. If they tell me they're cancerous, I'm going to be with Jesus. Yeah. This I know. <laughs> Why? For the Bible tells me so. <laughs> Man, do I want to leave? I do want to leave. <laughs> but I got a family. We all love our families. We don't want to go back. I want to finish my mission. Right. Run my race. All right. But now they are hid from their eyes, not ours. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round about and keep thee in on every side and shall lay uh, thee, even thy to the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave uh, upon another one stone because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Luke 19, 42 through 44. From the crest of Olive, Jesus looked over at Jerusalem. Fair and peaceful was the scene spread out before him. It was the season of Passover, and from all, all the lands the children of Jacob had gathered there to celebrate the great national festival. In the midst of the gardens and vineyards, the green slopes studded with pilgrims. Tents rose from the terraced hills. Tents. Just like they did in the Feast of Tabernacles, built booths. So when they come on Passover commanded, where are they going to stay at? They need to build booths again. And that's how, remember, I tied the two together for you guys. The stately palaces and massive bulwarks of Israel's capital, the daughter of Zion, seemed in her pride to say, Charlene, I sit as a queen and shall see no sorrow. I think that was in your notes. Something about a queen, right? As lovely then in deeming herself uh, to be secure in heaven's favor as when the ages before the royal minstrel sang beautiful for the situation the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion the city of the great king Psalms 48 2 and few in full view were the magnificent buildings of the temple the rays of the setting Sun lighted upon the snowy uh, whiteness of its marble walls remember what Jesus said about those white walls washed the sepulchers. Remember that? Gleam from the golden gate and the tower of its pinnacle, the perfection of beauty. It stood the pride of the Jewish nation. What shout of Israel could gaze upon the scene without a thrill of joy and admiration? But far from other thoughts occupied the mind of Jesus when he was come near. He beheld the city and wept over it amid the universal rejoicing of the triumphal entry while palm branches waved while glad hosannas awoke the echoes of the hills and thousands of voices declared him king the world's redeemer was overwhelmed with a sudden and mysterious sorrow he the son of god the promised one of israel whose power had conquered death and called its captives from the grave was now in tears not of an ordinary grief but of intense and pressionable agony because of what he saw man I know kind of what's coming because of what the Lord shows us in his word but we have no idea when Titus surrounded you know when he surrounded it every day they were crucifying putting people on stakes outside the city and use them for torches those days are coming again people it's important to know our Savior Jesus Christ right it's important for us to know that because we have hope his tears were not far from himself though he well knew whether his feet where his feet was tending he wept over the thousands that would die in Jerusalem. Let me skip over a couple of things. For ages the prophets had uttered their message of warning. The priests had waved their censers uh, and the cloud of incense with the prayers of worshipers had ascended before God. Their daily, their daily, the blood of slain lambs had been offered, pointing forward to the Lamb of God. Their Jehovah 
had revealed His presence in the cloud of glory above the mercy seat. They rested. The base of there, the, there rested the mystic ladder connecting heaven and earth. Ain't that something when Jacob had the dream, his head on the rock. Christ is the rock. He sees this ladder come from heaven to earth. That's why they call it Jacob's ladder down to Mount you know, Moriah. That's why Jesus said about you know, Jacob's ladder, where the, he's seen the angels ascending and descending into heaven. He professes himself. Just as you've seen that, you shall see the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. He is the stairway to heaven. He is the ladder that you and I must climb. That's why he's always telling us, come up. Come up a little higher. Come up a little higher. Let me tell you something. The higher you go in Jesus Christ, the better you can see. I'm going to stop. Um, I just feel like I need to end there. Man, with the time that we're in right now and the things that are going on, and in not too distant future, this world is going to undergo some serious things. When we come back, I'll read some more, and uh, if God permit, and if that's the way He wants to go. But in this season, the time we're in, remember this. In the darkest time of man's history, God planted a light. He sowed a light. And that light was Jesus Christ. So I want you guys, listen, whatever it is that you're going through, whatever you, you know, doom and gloom and all of these things you might hear, maybe you lost a loved one, you know, maybe just something happened. Look, there's hope. It's not Christ's, it's not God's fault. Right. And let me tell you something. You know, what happened to Jerusalem? They rejected Jesus. And because they rejected their Messiah, guess what? God removed his hand and said, okay, if you don't want me in your life, I'm going to remove my hand. Right? And he stepped back. Remember, he is our protector. He is our defender. He's the one that called us. We don't have to fear. He surrounds us. Like Satan said, you know, hey, God said, hey, have you considered my faithful servant Job in all the land? Who eschew, who eschew evil, right? Remember? And, and what did Satan say to him? Yeah, but, you know, remove your hedge. Remove your hand from him. Now, think about the covenant that Job was under. Of goats, bulls, lambs, you know, whatever they sacrificed bulls back then. How much greater the covenant are we under? The blood of Jesus Christ where those nails went in his hands. When those hands are over you and me, nothing can touch us. Nothing can touch us. And let me tell you something. Whatever happens to you and me, it's got to pass through those hands. That's right. It's got to pass through his hands. And you know, it's only there to make us stronger. That's right. But all we, all we have to do is keep relying on those hands. Father, I don't understand what's going on but I know that you got me. That's right. And that's why Jesus says, when I come, will I find faith. That's right. Why? Because when the Lord returns, faith is going to be scarce. But those who really believe is going to be holding on to that word. I know it looks bad. I know, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm trusting in him. That's right. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego Amen. said, what Hananiah, Meshach, and Azariah, O king, O king, whether you, you know, throw me in that fire or not, I'm not going to bow down to your worship. That's right. King Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, yeah? Turn it up seven times hotter. That's right. Where was God at? Was God outside with him? No, God was in a fire. That's right. God was in a fire. That's right. Wow. So I want you to be encouraged on this time. Because if anything at this time, this is a season of hope. Yes, it is. A great light has come. And that same great light that was planted in a woman back then, God wants to plant into you and me. Yeah. So why? So we can give birth to Jesus. Yes. We can just give. It's amazing. Every time someone receives, that's that light coming in. Bam. And we can show that light to others. Yes. So let's pray. Father. Lord, thank you for your son, Lord. Thank you for Jesus. Father, thank you, Lord, that, um, Lord, those that are here, those that are watching through Facebook or YouTube or wherever it might be, Lord, 
Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name, if they haven't received you, Lord, that, Father, they would open up their hearts, Father, so that that seed, your seed, yourself, Father, Jesus Christ, your Son, could be planted in us, Lord, so that we could be fruitful servants for you, Father, yes. to bring forth children for the Most High. Lord, thank you for your Son. Thank you for salvation. Father, thank you for your hedge of protection. Lord, I pray right now, Father, for those that are hurting, Lord, that are going through things. Lord, that, Lord, that you would send forth your Spirit, Lord, your angels to minister unto them, Lord. Send forth your Holy Spirit, Lord, and show them, Lord, that, Lord, that you're our comforter, Lord. Lord, your Word says, and I'm going to close with this, in Luke chapter 4, this is what you told us, Lord. This is what you've come to do. And this is what the Lord wants to do for you. Luke chapter 4, it says, um, he says, um, And Jesus returned in the power into the Spirit in, into Galilee. And there went out a name uh, with him throughout all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as a custom it was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found a place. He found the place where it was written. Amen. And he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Father, and I pray that you do that for those that are suffering right now. He sent me to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering sight to the blind. And to set at liberty them that are bruised. You know what a bruise is? It's an inner hurt. It's an inner hurt. And I pray if you're going through something on the inside that God will heal you. To preach... The acceptable year of the Lord. And what's amazing about that is the next verse in Isaiah 61 pronounces in the day of judgment. So here it is. We start with the coming of the Lord and this scripture is all about his return. So Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your son. Thank you, Lord, for giving us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive. And I pray that everyone in the sound of my voice, Father, would, would do that just thing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. amen. Be blessed, guys.